tangential perhaps a little bit, but um, broadly related to governance. We had a lot of discussions around this global soil protocol under the UNCCD, something that they're very interested in. And the um, Commission on Environmental Law is very interested in working on for 12 years. Um, I can go into that later, I don't want to go into detail now. Um, the Drylands Initiative um, needs to make a lot greater effort, I think the initiative within the Secretariat needs to make a lot greater effort to work across all different parts of the Union around implementation of the UNCCD. This is a kind of global policy that really applies to drylands, uh, or let's say really prioritizes drylands. And we need to figure out how to network across all the different branches of the Union, how to mainstream across all the different commissions, not only CEM. And all the thematic programs of the Secretariat, we're all living in silos too, and we've got to break that down. Uh, resource rights and governance, they come up as the root of pretty much all the challenges in the dry lands, one way or another. And there is a lot of emphasis now on community approaches. Um, so what I said just now, it doesn't really apply here about pilots. This has been piloted. Now we do need to go to scale. We know what to do. Now we need to get people excited about doing it. That's why we did the book launch the other day, to get people excited about dry lands. It's not always that easy. Um, um, we had discussions with various groups and figured that we need to start trying to steer the Parks Congress in a couple of years to address protected area guidelines to better recognise ICCAs, Indigenous and Community Conserved Areas. Uh, there's a great opportunity here. There's a working group on temperate grasslands in WCPA that's very keen on this. Um, and yes, protected areas can be a tool to reducing risk. For reducing risk, they can also be a, a cause of more risk if they're not done the right way. And then resilience, okay, this is what defines drylands. You know, these are highly uncertain places, um, but this understanding is not well reflected in pretty much anything that I've seen here, to be honest, and that's really where we need to put more emphasis. You want to learn about resilience and adaptation? Start with the drylands, because that's where you'll get the lessons. There's still a tendency to try and promote technologies as the solution, rather than trying to restore systems of governance that will actually enable people to use what they already know. Um, and resilience, we are using it as if it's a good thing all the time, and it's not. Sometimes it's, you know, there are very highly resilient, highly negative states. Um, I suspect in all sorts, certainly in drylands, I could read a few off. Um, there's a tension between ecosystem resilience and social resilience, I think, a little bit still. Um, and when you're talking about development processes and the need for change, it clashes sometimes with the need for conservation, meaning not to change, I think. I suppose there's a better way to articulate that. Um, and then there's multiple stresses, so don't get fixated just on climate change. I think we all know that. Uh, even though climate change is where the money is, fine, get the money, but then don't just deal with climate change because there's a lot of other bigger, more profound changes. Perhaps climate change is amplifying things, but it's not, <clears throat> not the only one. Right. Okay, thanks. Great, thank you very much, John. Um, it's, great. it's fascinating to see uh, the number of sort of common threads his way through this cobwebs, um, web of resilience and everything else. Kate, can you sort of contrast the islands now with the trilands? to that many islands um, things but there were some really the kind of keystone events and I think one of them was um, yesterday so <clears throat> I kind of was following the three slide three points on a slide rule apparently that was the only one uh, <laughs> but there was really uh, key messages one really about biosecurity it's really critical for islands and that there's lots and lots and lots and lots of things out there that islands are doing there was also a lot of um, reflection, and I think we also saw this in the EBA uh, one, about the importance of sharing lessons between regions on climate change adaptation. A lot of people have told me that they found that a lot of the things that they thought they were kind of struggling through on their own, in their own island or in their own region, they discovered in coming here that other people had exactly the same problems, and it may seem obvious, but... Um, okay, sorry. 
it may seem obvious, but it was it's come up repeatedly over the last few days, and that there's really an important um, issue around implementing ecosystem restoration and management, and obviously that is probably a really big focus for uh, the Commission on Ecosystem Management. Um, I think we took a sort of the same approach as the last presentation. Really, really important um, messages coming out about the importance of mainstreaming ecosystem-based adaptation, kind of looking at integration of it in planning at the national level in countries. And a lot of this is a reflection of small island developing states, but the island journey was much broader than that. Um, that good governance is really critical um, for management and, and conservation of island ecosystems. And that a really important element of good governance for islands is around the involvement of local people. And we heard that again in an event we just had um, at lunchtime. It's really important to strengthen leadership. And again, in the lunchtime event today, we saw the real importance of the connection between what people are doing on the ground and how that kind of scales up to mobilizing political will and to resources being made available to uh, kind of these priorities. And then, a kind of a re recurrent theme is really around this regional and local collaboration around peer learning networks and partnerships, trying to strengthen how people do things. And there was a lot of recognition that traditional capacity building for a lot of islands has not been as successful as it could have been. Largely that is because uh, there are really very few people on islands doing a lot of this work and Calvin would know from the Cook Islands probably his family may constitute the entire uh, effort. But that, that you have to look at capacity building in a different way, kind of looking at how do peers, how do you learn from each other on other islands, people working remotely, um, and how do you build kind of institutional capacity of places where it's not about training people. So those were kind of very recurrent themes that we heard over the last um, week or so. And then this really key one about partnerships, this, uh, issue around kind of trying to come together around these kind of key messages and around figuring out what it is that are really key things for islands and I think uh, I'll see if Calvin has anything to add or Dr. Guillet at the back there who was also helping us with the island journey. putting you on the spot, Kate, but you know, uh, I also didn't get to too many of the um, island uh, theme uh, things that were going on. There was just too much to do. But uh, I think one one thing that uh, is fairly um, important for islands, I think, is their vulnerability. Often they've, they've got very limited, um, when I say vulnerability, I mean vulnerability in, in, in livelihoods. They've often got very limited sources of livelihood. And if, if, say, for example, climate change uh, impacts one of those, then they, they've got nothing else to turn to. So I think they're particularly vulnerable, uh, perhaps compared to larger uh, land, land masses. Uh, and uh, the other thing I did uh, see at two of the um, uh, presentations I went to was this, uh, uh, and again, it's not restricted to islands, but here's two examples of islands where uh, we have a problem is, you know, as we've all heard uh, here with Jeju, with you know, government conflicting uses, government wants to use a very important area for developing a naval base, uh, which is in conflict with local people's, um, you know, need to conserve that for their own livelihoods. And um, that was brought up in a couple of uh, presentations. And also the other one was uh, Okinawa, which is, okay, a big island, but uh, still a similar situation where there's a, uh, pressure that they're, they're going to have another big naval base there and it's going to destroy a lot of uh, the very sensitive uh, local uh, ecosystems that people rely on. So there are a the couple of other things that I, I picked up along the way. Great, we got one more presentation I want to, because I want Mike to help round off it and then we're going to have a little short session of more clarification to people and then we're going to go into some groups to discuss a few questions that Steve and myself have 
dreamt up and see if we can move some forward and get into more concrete actions. So Mike. Thank you. All right, I, I did my own thing with this as well because uh, I did my own thing with the presentation as well because it has to try and wrap everything up together. And it's also about reminding you a little bit about what resilience is about. So just very quickly, resilience is about models for change, simple models to help you understand how change processes work in social and ecological systems. The main ingredients, potential for change, all the capitals that exist within a system, connectedness refers to the, the regulation of the system both internally and its relationship with other systems at higher levels of scale. Those two, potential and connectedness, determine the resilience of a system. Sticking points, a rigidity trap. This is a system that's stuck when it needs to change. It can't change and there are many examples of rigidity traps in the world today. Somehow or other we've got to find ways of releasing those rigidity traps so that systems at all levels of scale can function properly. At the bottom here, poverty traps. There are also many examples of poverty traps around the world. These are systems that have lost their resilience, they've lost their capital, they've lost their connectedness. It's very difficult to get them up and running again. Ecological restoration, ecosystem restoration, that's all about dealing with poverty traps. So change then occurs across multiple levels of scale, which is what this panicking model tells you. Basic interactions are change from below, stability from above. Those then lead us to this idea of um, systems with an alternate stable states. It's the threshold between these alternate stable states, the ball being the system, the little hump being the threshold, and the cup representing two alternative states. What happens when a system loses resilience is that a disturbance such as climate change, earthquakes, whatever you like, may shift the system from one alternate state into another. M managing for resilience is all about understanding how those tipping points, how those thresholds work. It's all about knowing how to manage thresholds. These are those same models which focus on the, the operational definition of resilience. The resilience of what system or what parts of a system what kinds of disturbance. Once you, once you determine that, then you can actually build a model which is based on the panicky, the three levels, based on uh, basins and balls representing the system, basins representing a model of the resilience of each system within its basin. This, this dimension here, precariousness, is a measure of risk. Stewardship. This is the, the, the uh, planetary boundaries model. Planetary boundaries represent limits to change. Changes beyond which we don't want to go. We're already over the top biodiversity uh, with climate change and with nitrogen. Rural stewards affect every part of this. They are fundamentally important to the future of our planet. Rural stewards, rural stewards are particularly influenced by their interactions with policies of government and other actors in the systems. That includes people like yourselves representing the non-profit organization. It represents business interests and so on. But rural stewardship is really at the heart of a great deal of it. Resilience itself. This is a simple assessment of general resilience. This is something that any person in this room working with a group of their stakeholders can do relatively easily. It doesn't take much time to get your head around it simple, straightforward to understand. There are, there are a total of 13 different attributes of resilient systems here. In total, they represent the, the attributes necessary for the general resilience of a system. If you were to, to look at each of these and discuss them in relation to your particular system, you, would be, you could identify the status of the system in regard to these attributes, what the trends are, whether it's going up or down, and then you could consider, well, what's driving the trend? Once you start to think about what's driving the trend, you're moving from a simple static assessment into getting an understanding of the dynamics of the system. Once you've, once you've thought about what's driving the change, then you can think about, well, what can we do to inhibit it? If it's driving the system in a direction that we don't want, what can we do to inhibit it? 
So that, that then leads you to feedbacks. Reinforcing feedbacks, which are drivers, balancing feedbacks, which bring systems back into equilibrium. Some ideas for you to think about. This is just a proposition that I'm putting out on the table for you all to think about as you go through <coughs> the rest of this program this afternoon. Create a, a resilience working group within the commission that is linked to the secretariat. Address issues of policy and law. Lots of people that I <coughs> spoke to and I've heard today too. The, the question of governance, the question of changing laws to provide the flexibility that landowners, land stewards need in order to change as their, as their environment changes around them. Support for learning by doing, for capacity building. I think this is, is extraordinarily urgent. And then building cross-commission networks as they are necessary to further the, the objectives of the working group. So that's just there for you to think about. Thank you very much. Clarification, please, before we spend some time in group work discussing uh, four key areas. And we have a roving microphone there. Karen first. Yeah, hi, I had a quick question for Kate. Uh, biosecurity, what does that mean, please? Basically, it's trying to take an approach that um, both New Zealand and now Micronesia are taking to um, invasive species, protecting islands from invasive species. So, um, at the moment, of Micronesia, so the five countries of um, the top part of the Pacific, have just developed a regional biosecurity plan. So, trying to stop things coming in and manage what they have. Any other questions? Yes, there's a front here. And uh, just provide your, everyone provide their name and where they might be working from. Yeah, Johan Shaw from World Resources Institute. Um, so several of the presentations have emphasized the importance of uh, social ecological interaction, or the, the importance of looking at livelihoods together with ecosystems. But still, the emphasis is here is very much uh, the ecosystem perspective. Have you come across in your journeys a more explicit presentation or articulation of this kind of interaction? For, for example, we, we discuss the kinds of indicators and, and variables whereby we can follow ecosystem change. What about the social change uh, that is linked to or triggered by uh, ecolo ecological change? If you pass it over to Steve there on the side. Well, Mark. Um, just one comment for myself, though. I, I think there are there are a lot of other workshops who are doing essentially that as well, and we clearly need to interact with those ones. Yeah, um, a resilience assessment is based on an assessment of the social and ecological system. It's very much concerned with the interactions between the two. The assessment considers what's happening on the biophysical domain, what's happening in the social domain, and what's happening in the economic domain. And it looks at the interactions between these in terms of the thresholds of potential change. Okay, so Steve, do you want to say a few words? Do you yeah, like that? Um, from your other journeys and so forth? Yeah, no, I think that, that um, the message we're trying to convey is that uh, the humans are, are an integral part of those ecosystems. Uh, most, of the, most of the treatments that you hear about or see or engage in really view the people as observers of ecosystems. And in fact, I think under the resilience model, uh, what, we're, what we're trying to do is, is actually say, you are a part of it. You are not independent of it. And therefore, your actions are going to be affecting whatever that, that system is that we're looking at. And that's a pretty important step forward. Um, 
we're, we're not independent of the ecosystems that we're looking at. Can I? Yep. Tell me you're going to get into this. Yeah. I'm a bit hesitant because I'm not a resilience expert like you guys, but I raise a comment similar to that, and I feel also that there's a bit of a bias towards ecological systems still. And we look at social systems, but how they affect social uh, ecological systems. And I think we still take it our, our, on faith that there are these states and transitions and transformations and thresholds in social systems, which I don't see so much evidence of. And I think they're much more proactive systems. And I think, maybe I'm wrong, maybe you can give examples, but I suspect that's an area where we need to be careful. Thank you. No, that's a very good point, and it's it's a bone of contention between the uh, social scientists and uh, and the resilient scientists. Social scientists are critical of resilience because resilience hasn't really taken into account the power of people to invent all kinds of things. Power and agency is something that humans have, which uh, biophysical systems simply don't have. We have foresight. We have tremendous knowledge. Um, it enables us to manipulate systems in ways that nothing else can. So that means in terms of any kind of